from Microbe TV. This is Twin, This Week in Neuroscience, episode 48, recorded on February 12, 2024. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the nervous system. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Jason Shepard. Hey, Vincent. Hey, Tim. And from New York, Tim Chung. Hi. Hi, Vincent. Hi, Jason. Hello. We're here, here in New York, it got, it got cold, 8 degrees C and cloudy, and um, I don't know, there's a storm watch, but those never come through, so I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> you might come to regret those words. Hopefully not. We'll see. Take, you know, it's interesting. I've been taking the train now for a couple of years, and the train shuts down sometimes. The tracks freeze or some garbage. It's just ridiculous. Uh, I think that's a very New York-specific problem because it has notoriously bad subway. Really? Oh, it's. I mean, it's almost random whether you get to your destination. <laughs> it is. Like, it would skip stops. Really? Sometimes it never arrives. Uh, sometimes people <laughs> fall into the track. Um, yeah, it's almost random. Uh, is there a subway in Hong Kong? Yeah, it's much better than... It's really it's good? It's really good. Okay. Yeah. It's on time. It's super clean. Sometime. You can probably e eat off the seats if you want to. Um, <laughs> please don't do that. I feel like just about any public transport I've been to overseas is better than, than, yeah, than anything the US. in the yeah. States. So uh, the um, the Washington D.C. metro is not bad. I hmm. like that metro. Yeah, that's true. I've been to Japan. That's fabulous. It's as crowded as anything. Yeah. Um, and Paris is is pretty good. The, London is not bad either. It's just tiny. Yeah, London's very <laughs> small. It's built. Up, the excuse is it was built like 120 years ago, 140 years uh, yeah, ago, when right. people were smaller. Seeing something, I'm updating some like one station in New York costs billions of dollars. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, they put a you know they put this new sec Second Avenue line in, right? The Q or something, which is very convenient because you can get to the East Side easily now. Mm -hmm. But it costs billions and billions of dollars. Took forever. Everything is expensive here. Um, all right, today I'm going to try my hand at presenting a paper, and and of course I picked one that has viruses in it. <laughs> And so it's viruses and molecular biology. I can handle that. And then all the background uh, CNS stuff, I have two hosts here that are going to help me out. This is Cell Reports, Single Cell Transcriptomics of Human Traumatic Brain Injury Reveals Activation of Endogenous Retroviruses in Oligodendroglia. Uh, the first author is Raquel Garza, and there seem to be Two, two last authors, Johan Jacobson and Nicholas Marklund. So I'm in a number of uh, institutes in Sweden, Denmark, and even NYU. I don't know, Department of Neuroscience and Physiology. Oh, Would that be where you are? <laughs> that is NYU, Tim? but I think neuroscience is probably... Oh, it's NYU Langone Health. It's probably downstairs somewhere. That's, that's Molly Hamill as well. Yeah. So she just moved from Cold Spring Harbor to... NYU. She's an expert on retrotransposons. Uh -huh. ah. Oh, I might have went. I might have gone to one of her talks. Actually, yeah, I think she, we've we've collaborated a little bit. She she works on ALS and some of these neurodegenerative disorders. Hmm. Okay, so this is this is about traumatic brain injury, right? Where you're in a car accident, or someone hits you with a hammer, or you fall. And this is bad, and because of mortality, but and afterwards you can have long-term problem I think right? it's uh, but it's if I'm correct me if I'm wrong because I don't I know almost nothing about this but I think it's different from the brain injury that football players get from chronic kind of impact which is a chronic traumatic mm. encephalopathy one of those like CTE has a different name it's a different name so those one. are like much more long-term injury whereas traumatic brain injury is like a one-off like yeah. super That's big right. impact yeah and anyway, so when you have traumatic brain injury, you, you damage neurons and glial cells and axons and the blood vessels. And um, it gets worse because then you have uh, some neuroinflammation happening. When you get damaged to tissue, you're going to get inflammation. That's part of the 
attempt to heal. And so uh, in the brain, not a great thing to have inflammation. It's a, it's a closed space. There's not a lot of room for swelling. Uh, and so this inflammation plays a role in um, reco recovery and also in um, giving you an increased risk for things like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease. So th this paper really is about the, uh, the neuroinflammation uh, and w what happens there. Um, apparently, microglial cells are activated. Peripheral immune cells come into the CNS. Hmm. Astrocytes, oligodendrocyte precursors and uh, oligodendrocytes are also involved in driving uh, this response. So, and uh, go ahead. Just quickly comment, like it's actually, so, so we're going to, Vincent is going to tell us about how the oligodendrocytes are really involved in this traumatic brain right. injury, which to me, naively, is very surprising because um, oligodendrocytes are really involved. We think of it being involved in myelinating axons um, in, in the central nervous system. So they are kind of providing, um, at least classically, textbook, they would, uh, provide mm. insulation to the axons so that the conduction is much more efficient. So it actually ends up jumping from nodes to nodes and allow much mm. more efficient um, and also faster external signaling propagation. Um, whereas for things like inflammation and you know repair, you would expect things like microglia to be involved, uh, perhaps mm. astrocytes to be involved. So it's actually quite surprising that we would find out the oligodendrocytes, these myelinating guys are. Yeah, but I think they're, you know, more and more uh, recent studies are showing that glia as a whole are much more responsive to environmental cues than, than before. And actually, you know, the OPCs, which are sort of the precursor cells to oligodendrocytes seem really a hybrid kind of, um, so you're absolutely right, the, the main function of oligodendrocytes traditionally is thought to be myelin, myelination, of course that's still the case. Um, but there is sort of interesting um, neuroscience coming out, you know, one of the things that came out recently was that uh, these OPCs actually can make synapses onto mm -hmm. neurons. Mm -hmm. And as we sort of talked about it in the previous episode about cancer cells making synapses, I think we're we're finding out that these glia cells can really affect synapses more than we thought. This inflammatory response they call a sterile response, which is a nice term because there's no, well, as far as we know, there's no viruses or bacteria involved, right? Or so well, we thought. So we thought, yeah. So we thought. Although, now, I, it, although I would say maybe if you have traumatic brain injury, um, even if there's no like external wound, you probably cause some blood-brain barrier to be ruptured, perhaps. So there might be yeah. like exchange from the periphery into the brain. Um, Could be, sure. Yeah. Anyway, this, there's, they have previous evidence that endogenous retroviruses might be involved in neuroinflammation. So what are these? These are retroviral DNA. So retroviruses are RNA viruses, but they make a DNA copy uh, of their genome when they infect cells. And that DNA integrates into the host cell as an obligatory part of the reproduction cycle. And our ancestors were infected with many different retroviruses over time. And about 8% of the genome of humans uh, consists of integrated retroviruses. They're called endogenous retroviruses because they're integrated into the germline. We pass them on to our offspring. Um, many of them are silent. They're transcriptionally turned off by histone modification. Some of them are actually active and make particles, uh, but they don't, they're not infectious and, and we, those particles can't infect uh, other tissues or other people. Um, but under certain conditions, they can be transcriptionally activated. And um, that's what they decided to look at here. The idea is that if somehow traumatic brain injury activates transcription of... Uh, endogenous retroviruses, then the viral DNA would be recognized as foreign by the innate immune system, and that could lead to inflammation. <clears throat> of course, we don't know if, if that's actually <laughs> the response to traumatic brain injury or if it's a response to inflammation, but they wanted to get a little more information um, on what's going on. And so 
the approach here is to get brain tissue Sorry. from people. Sorry, Vincent, I've got a question before we dive in. Yeah, Just yeah. on the background sure. of like endogenous retrovirus, uh, specifically right. human, because we're looking at humans here. Um, yes. So to for a piece of genome to <clears throat> excuse me qualify as a endogenous retrovirus, does it have mm. to have does it have to express like a set of genes um, before it qualifies? Because yeah. if I <clears throat> remember well, it doesn't correctly, have to express them. like it doesn't have to express them. It just has to have. There has to be, you know, the viral genome long terminal repeats, repeated sequences at each mm. end, and then the the retroviral gene gag, pull, and envelope mm -hmm. uh, are typically present. Although they're high, often highly mutated, so they don't make infectious viruses. Right. So you look by genome sequencing. Um, so expression is not the key, it's just the presence of the genome. Ah, uh, so, okay, okay. But like, for example- But you know, it, go, ahead, um, go ahead. But like, for example, if I remember correctly, Jason, you, you've showed that things like ARC, which is a protein <laughs> that is important for memory in the brain, that has shared certain kind of um, similarity with um, these retrovirus, endogenous retroviruses in terms of like, is it the gag protein that, or maybe just not, maybe not endogenous retrovirus, but other kind of retroviruses? Yeah, and I had the same question for, for Vincent because I'm kind of curious what, what what you think. From I mean, there's sort of a debate here where the um, retrotransposons. What's the difference between a retrotransposon mm. and a virus, <clears throat> retrovirus? And you know, the the main difference is usually that the retrotransposons don't get into the germline. They don't infect other cells. Um, but there certainly seems to be the case that a lot of these um, repetitive elements are transposon derived that became yeah. germline, yeah. but they're not necessarily an infection from an infection. And they don't have the, usually the, like the envelope um, gene. Right. So That's right. That's right. No envelope. That's the key distinguishing factor between a a, a retro transposon. So that m word means the transposition of the element depends on reverse transcription. Mm. And endogenous retrovirus is the presence of an envelope, uh, the retro transposons. And mm -hmm. the retro transposons, they don't have an envelope. They're thought to be ancestral to uh, endogenous retroviruses, right? Uh, okay. Right. They're, they're probably around for many years and then they, a subset acquired an envelope and they became. Uh, Retroviruses, yeah. But I know there was a debate whether some retrotransposons lost the envelope, and that's why yeah. they became. Mm. Yes, although I mean, the retrovirologists tell me there's good phylogenetic evidence that right. uh, retro elements predate endogenous retroviruses. Right. Yeah. Well, it's interesting in some species, the endogenous retroviruses give rise to infectious virus, like in mice. They have endogenous retroviruses that give rise to infectious particles that can then in infect other mice. But in humans, they're all non-infectious. Although, um, as we study, we we find they're they're becoming more and more important. Of course, the classic example is the syncytion gene that's needed for placental development is a exapted retroviral envelope gene. Right. Right. It's taken out of an endogenous retrovirus. It moved somewhere else. And now it makes this protein that's essential for fusion of the outer layer of the uh, placenta. And then the LTRs contain promoter elements. Hmm. Those have been taken. In fact, the, those LTR-derived promoter elements drive re interferon responses. You can find ah. I mean, interferon-responsive genes. <laughs> they have... Uh, inter uh, promoter elements derived from endogenous retroviruses. So, I mean, these things have been in the genome for hundreds of thousands of years. So, uh, we we make use of them, you know. <laughs> and I'm sure more remains to be found, like as as this paper shows, mm. right? So they their approach is to take tissue, brain tissue from patients. They have 12 patients with severe traumatic brain injury. And um, they had to have surgery to remove tissue to decompress because the, the inflammation was causing too much uh, pressure in, your, in the brain. So they take a little tissue out and then you can get access to that tissue uh, as they did in this paper. And these tissues 
Um, so they're, they're derived from the, the damaged regions of the brain. They're taken between four hours and eight days after injury. And these, these patients are alive at the time this is done. Uh, and then eight, there's a control set of tissues. Eight days is a very long the, time. I wonder what happened there. Eight days is a long time, yeah. I mean, maybe they had less severe and it didn't cause yeah. inflammation. Yeah. As, I don't know, yeah. So what do you do for controls? Uh, <laughs> they actually say in the, in the discussion, there's no perfect control for... <laughs> Uh, the best control would be a piece of the same person just before the brain injury. Obviously, you can't do that, right? Or, or yeah. in a bit of the opposite side of the head that has no injury, but you also don't want to do you that. You could always argue that something's going on there, that's, right? That's true, actually, yeah. So what they do is uh, they have patients, they're older patients. So the main, mean age of this study is 49 and a half years, but the controls are from people 69, 75, and 87 years old. These are people who died from non-neurological issues. So they get a piece of their brain, and that's the best you can do. Uh, so what they do is they, they make RNA. They take individual nuclei. So this is single nuclei transcriptomics. <laughs> You've heard of single cell <laughs> RNA-seq. This is single nucleus RNA-seq. They have... Um, from the samples, the 12 TBI samples, they have 6,806 nuclei, and they get about 2,300 genes uh, per nucleus uh, doing this, okay? And so what do they do with these data? So they have lots of RNA sequences. So the first thing they say, well, what kind of cells um, do we have in this tissue that we took? Right, You're just getting a piece of tissue from the surgeon. Um, they get... Um, excitatory neurons, they have inhibitory neurons, they have oligodendrocytes, oligodendrocyte precursors, astrocytes, endothelial cells, and microglia macrophages. And they get these cell types, <clears throat> so you can distinguish the cell types based on the RNA sequence data. Mm -hmm. They get them from the controls and from the patient population. Uh, and it seems they seem to be the overall composition uh, seems to be similar. Although some of the patients right. are missing quite a few neurons. Um, yeah. And then like seem to have a lot of oligodendrocytes, which is quite weird. Um, yeah, they, they've mentioned that it's really challenging to get the samples from the, the injured yeah. patients because it's like full of blood and like the tissue's injured. So it's quite hard. Sure. It's like sure. a different condition. Yeah. So they have... The most abundant cell type, excitatory neurons, 50% of their cells. Then interneurons, 20%. Astrocytes, 13%. Oligos, 9%. Microglia, 2%. That's the control. In the TBI samples, yeah, as, as uh, Tim said, there's a reduction in the excitatory nu neurons to 29% uh, from 50%. Uh, and the oligos and the microglia are higher. And that's, I mean, to be honest, that's not that surprising because we know that the excitatory neurons are the first cells to die <laughs> okay. after TBI. So they probably, especially at this point, lost a lot of those cells in the area. Yeah, that's yeah. what they say. It's probably a consequence of the of the injury. And this increase in the in the in the oligodendrocytes, they say, well, there's more mo white matter in these uh, in these samples that they got. They got more white matter tissue. So uh, that's probably that. Maybe it's not real. Okay, so all right, so you know what kind of cells are there. So what about transcriptional responses? You, you can look at what genes are going on. So they look at um, the, each of these cells have a distinct transcriptional response. And so in the excitatory neurons, you have an increase in genes link, in gene expression of genes linked to synaptic functions. In the microglia, uh, you have an increase of transcription of genes linked to the cell cycle. Yeah, because those cells are apparently proliferating in response to injury. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, guys, why would you have an increase in synaptic functions in in the neurons? Well, I think I think um, I mean at this point in in the you know after the injury, uh, there's a lot of homeostatic uh, processes that get kicked in, and if you're losing cells. Uh, the remaining cells that are healthy probably want to um, increase the synapses so that there's more connection, you know, connectivity. So there's there's some plasticity that happens, and even at this point, and 
adults where you can get um, more synaptic connections being built after you know in, in the surviving cells. Yeah. I see. But you, if you okay. look at the the figures at the end that they talk about these things. Um, actually, a lot of these synaptic genes in the excitatory neurons, they are downregulated, mm. um, not just upregulated. So they say it is you know, dysregulated. And the downregulation might be mm. because a lot of the connecting partners have died and they have to yeah, kind of deal with that. So these, these microglial genes linked to the cell cycle, so they have, uh, they say they're in a proliferating state. They don't see that in the controls. Mm. So... The control samples don't have this upregulation of cell cycle genes, so they find so they conclude that they're, they're seeing um, evidence for neuronal dysfunction and the initiation of a microglial response uh, after TBI. Uh, in other cell types, the the oligodendrocyte precursors and the mature oligodendrocytes, they see a uh, a gene profile linked to inflammation. So a lot of genes involved in innate immunity and interferon responses are upregulated like STAT, the STAT1 and STAT2 genes. Um, in, in the mature oligodendrocytes, they get activation of, of um, genes related to uh, interferon gamma stimulus and, and cytokine stimulus. So th those molecules, interferon and cytokines, bind receptors and turn on another set of genes. And so you can see those genes being turned up as well. And in general, a lot of genes that have antiviral properties normally, right, <laughs> that, are, that are being turned on here. Um, also turned up in oligodendrocytes are uh, MHC genes. Mm. That's one and two MHC genes, which is, again, something you would see um, in an infection. Um, That's kind of surprising. And, uh, like even MHC class two, which I, <clears throat> um, I think if I remember some immunology lectures that I watched, um, MHC class two is supposed <laughs> to be mainly expressed in like professional phagocytosing, yeah, APCs, like, yeah. And, yeah, exactly, or like maybe B cells. And the whole point is they eat things, and then you want to show them to you know T cells and see if this is yeah. this thing that I've eaten is good or bad. And I don't know whether oligodendrocytes go around phagocytosing things. Um, yeah, so it's a, I don't know whether, so I don't know whether this is a normal immune response or something specific to oligodendrocytes. Do, uh, Jason, do oligos phagocytose? Yeah, so there is emerging data that they can uh, also, certainly the OPCs can, um, uh, cool. can do this. Um, Lucas Cheadle at Cold Spring Harbor had a na nature neuroscience paper showing that there is engulfment of debris. Hmm. Now, you know, how, what, how that can, and I think there, so all the glia, even astrocytes now are implicated in, in the sort of phagocytosis and, hmm. but it's not clear. Is there any specificity in this? Are there things that one yeah. cell, cell type will engulf versus others? So yeah, hmm. it's hmm. ongoing. In, in, uh, in contrast, in microglia and astrocytes, they don't see very much, uh, inflammatory response in terms of these genes that they're seeing in the oligodendrocytes. So I wonder if that's surprising because microglia being the the resident macrophage, yeah. you think that's the <laughs> one that is you know should be freaking out that the the brain is getting damaged, but it seems to be an yeah. oligodendrocyte yeah. An OPC response. Yeah. So all of these data are um, RNA seq. So they decide to look at some protein production to see if uh, you confirm it. So they do immunohistochemistry um, and they use antibodies. Uh, so they have an antibody to STAT1, which is one of these uh, involved in interferon signaling. And then they combine it with a, uh, a marker for oligodendrocytes. <clears throat> and what they find is the tissue from the control patients. There's very little STAT1 production in oligodendrocytes, but there's an induction of STAT1 in those same cells from TBI tissue. <clears throat> so at least one gene that they've looked at uh, is going up also. So you have some kind of transcriptional response in oligodendrocytes, which is unique to them after TBI, um, which they say transformed the cell into an immune-like cell state. 
<clears throat> and they say, you know, this is kind of re reminiscent of what happens after a viral infection. And, you know, if you turned on transcription of ERVs, that could activate an interferon response. Um, Double-stranded RNAs, DNAs, even proteins could uh, do that. Although, you know, uh, if the proteins are present since birth and de development, you might not have, they may be recognized as self. It depends if they've been silenced all the time or not. Hmm. So I think a lot of these, so it's interesting, a lot of these, <clears throat> some of these herbs are actually expressed uh, during early development, you know, two, four, eight cell stages, and then they're turned off after that, which is then they would not be recognized as anything because there's no protein. So anyway, they decided, let's look at herbs. So they can use bioinformatics to look for ERV sequences uh, in their data set. There are there's a single nucleus RNA seq data set, and they do find um, certain. So, so ERVs are classified into subfamilies phylogenetically. Some of them are very old. Some of them are very young, and they find uh, upregulation of transcripts for some of these. Uh, Herbs in particular, some uh, there's one called Herv Herv K, Human Endogenous Retrovirus K, Herv K. That's a famous one. Uh, it's a pretty young one. In fact, her, one of the Herv Ks has been resuscitated. <laughs> oh, so sorry, resuscitated from from being non-infectious because uh, in the genome there's a lot of mutations that have accumulated that render it non-infectious. But if you compare uh, sequences you can event you can make a consensus that is infectious and Paul B Nash at Rockefeller has done uh, that and others have done it as well okay and you can make virus you can it's like a phoenix right you bring it back from the dead okay is, <laughs> Any, so is that the so like all herbs human and endogenous retroviruses they don't make infectious particle but by resuscitating they right. now are, can be infectious well you can one type has been resuscitated oh. a, a herf K okay. yeah and Interesting. They haven't done it with all of them, but yes. Uh, do um, you know if, um, like, if you go to do all the paleo, paleo DNA that from like people that digging up from the permafrost, however many years ago, are are those genomes have uh, and herbs that yeah, are? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Oh yeah, the um, or like the Neanderthal. I don't know about infectivity, but the Neanderthal and Denisovan genomes have, have endogenous, endogenous retroviruses. Okay, okay. It's very clear. Yeah. All right, so their timing of their, of their samples indicate that this ERV transcriptional regulation happens pretty early uh, after injury. Oh, actually, Vincent, I have a question. So yeah. they mentioned that all these, they have all these um, upregulated um, HERVs, uh, the right. endogenous retroviruses, and that they are all young, evol evolutionarily young. Um, I'm guessing right. that ties into them being human. Um, so my question is, are there ERVs, endogenous retroviruses, that are evolutionary old, that are shared between humans and, say, like other mammals? Mm. That, that, yeah, and, and yeah if, well, other primates, yeah. And if yes, are, do they not get upregulated by brain injury? Is it only the young ones? Appar like apparently that? not. Huh. No, it's interesting. Um, so there are many that we inherited from our ancestors, right? Or common ancestors. Okay that are older than Homo sapiens, mm. right? And those are not upregulated here. It's only the young ones, right? <laughs> Evolutionarily young, you know, one or 200,000 years ago. Huh. Okay. I wonder, they, do they talk about why that is? What is the regulation of old versus young? No, kids? they don't. Okay. They okay. don't at all. I don't, yeah, it's a good question. You would think they would. Yeah. All right, so this uh, RNA seq data, it's um, it's not perfect. It's kind of um, it's biased towards one end. It's, it's three prime biased basically. So they do um, more deep sequencing of of their their uh, RNA, so they can get complete ERV genomes, and they end up with um, a couple of, of a number of complete uh, ERV genomes. And they can now see um, 13 upregulated ERV loci in the um, TBI samples. 
and the sequence, the genome of a retro is about 12 KB or so, 12 to 15, and they get genomes from 6 to 13 and a half, and 13 of them are upregulated. And, and some uh, are only upregulated in oligodendrocytes, and, and those ones that are only up in oligodendrocytes are the ones exclusively found in the TBI tissue. And as they say, like as Tim just mentioned, these activated ERV loci represent evolutionary young elements present only in primates, including some human-specific ERVs. So there's some that we have that chimpanzees and, and gorillas don't have, for example. Hmm. So they say this is potentially doing um, in, d turning on the innate immune system, right? You turn these these ERVs are coming on pretty early and they're making RNAs and DNAs and proteins and that could turn on the innate immune system. Does this happen in other type of... Does it happen in virus? Like if you have a vir viral infection and, you, and your cell turns on um, interferon, do the cell mm. also start making all these human endogenous retroviruses? Because like for here, for example, they only see it in oligodendrocytes. Um, yeah, there's definitely been other papers showing that there's reactivation of these human herbs in neurodegenerative diseases as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Um, and not just, yeah, and, and I would say the OPC, well, the, the oligodendrocytes here is sort of a interesting twist because other, the other papers sort of generally just looked at, I mean, that's the advantage of this technique is that you can look at cell type specificity. Mm -hmm. So they do... Um, <clears throat> the final experiment where they um, do something in cell culture, they have uh, they make <clears throat> um, human glial progenitor cells from uh, human embryonic stem cells. So they take human embryonic stem cells, they differentiate them into <laughs> human glial progenitor cells. And, you know, typical of these um, derivations, it takes 135 days. Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine if at the end of that, you, your cells get contaminated? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Anyway, in the end, they have human glial progenitor cells, and they treat them with interferon gamma. And then two days later, they do their RNA-seq, their um, RNA-seq analysis. And you can see, of course, a transcriptional response. That's not surprising. That's what interferon gamma does. It binds receptors and turns on many interferon-stimulated genes. But they say they find <clears throat> a correlation between uh, the upregulation of genes in these cell cultures and those that are activated in the TBI samples. Hmm. So, you know, these adding interferon gamma is turning on a similar set of genes in these cultures of glial cells, pro progenitors, as they see in the um, TBI samples. Um, and so they also look at ERV expression in these cultured glial progenitor cells um, after interferon gamma treatment. And they see uh, several ERV subfamilies are upregulated. Their genomes are upregulated, including uh, HERV-K. And these are some of the ones that are upregulated in the TBI samples. But they don't find upregulation of other transposable elements like line elements, which uh, are not retrotransposons. Hmm. So somehow this response to interferon gamma is specific to uh, endogenous retroviruses. Okay. So basically what they find is that in cells and culture, at least, adding interferon gamma, you get uh, a, s a similar gene response, including ERV activation. So... You know, it's hard to know what's going on in in traumatic brain injury. What happens first, right? If um, the uh, interferon's made first as a consequence of inflammation, and that turns on the herbs, or the and that makes it worse, or could the traumatic brain injury turn on herb expression, and that leads to um, an innate immune response, which exacerbates yeah, I, the whole thing. You know, I, I would say in this case, I find it hard to imagine that um, the endogenous rich viruses would would have such a big impact on the inflammation response. I think this is yeah. the other way around, where 
you get this general inflammation because of the TBI and then maybe the herbs get reactivated, but right. the role of those herbs in anything use, you know, sort of down the road, it's unclear, I would say. So you're saying you don't know if they have any role in the disease whatsoever, yeah. right? As yeah. opposed to, I think, like more chronic disease where, um, you know, I think the, uh, there's clear sort of potential timelines that this could, yeah. that the impact of the herbs could really be something important. Um, although I guess we know we know from, t from lots of research that TBI, um, TBI has predisposed you to neurodegeneration down the road if you do survive the TBI. Mm -hmm. But then uh, in yeah. the paper, they also showed like timeline wise, these herbs, herbs tend to get reactivated early on after the injury. Mm. So it is an acute response. So, so yeah, so not sure yeah. if how persistent these guys are around for. Well, yeah. the, in, the innate response is, the inflammation is pretty quick also, mm. right? So mm -hmm. that makes sense. So they, they say that in a, in a rat model of traumatic brain injury, if they give them antibody to interleukin-1 beta, which is a big pro-inflammatory cytokine, it, it, uh, reduces the the effects of the injury which is interesting i wonder does any either of you know if they have explored in human clinical trials the use of uh, Im immune suppressors in uh, tbi at all that i don't know i bet i mean they could use steroids right yeah. just, yeah, just to reduce the inflammation steroids um and like even sort of anti um kind of similar treatments to stroke where yeah. It's the hypoxia and that sort of initial acute cell death that you want to stop first. But Yeah. Um, they also say, as we have kind of discussed, that the oligodendral site seems to have new roles, including antigen-presenting cells, <laughs> which Tim mentioned, right? They're not, but they, they're upregulating MHC. And uh, so maybe they are changing in some way that's interesting. Yeah, it's uh, hard for me to wrap my head around because in my naive brain, at least not sure about the OPC, which are the precursor cells, but the mature oligodendrocytes, they are like wrapping around a lot of axons. So I don't even know how they push their presentation out to maybe the cell body is exposed somewhere for other for T cells to see. Yeah, like it's yeah. a bit hard for me. I guess they do, yeah. They actually, now that I'm picturing a diagram in my head, I think the cell body sends mm -hmm. processes to myelin. So maybe the soma is available yeah yeah so the um the they'd have a little nice little discussion about so first they say we don't know how um what triggers the interferon response initially right but yeah after tbi but they say it could be linked to release of mitochondrial dna mm -hmm. into the cytosol mm -hmm. um or, or damage to genomic dna which happens as a result of tbi that those are those are plausible ways of in, of activating innate responses. Some viruses, some RNA viruses, for example, when they infect cells, they destroy the mitochondria. The DNA comes out, and it's sensed that it triggers an innate immune response, which is against the DNA, not the actual RNA infecting virus. So, uh, any kind of mitochondrial damage could do that. That would make right. sense. And they also say we can't tell what the role of herbs is. Uh, in boosting and driving the immune response. Um, they do say that uh, there's some evidence that um, some of the proteins that are made by endogenous retrovirus genomes can activate immune pathways, and they give some examples of that. And in fact, um, when, I think we did this, I don't remember which podcast, but there was a, I think it was immune, right, where P certain patients with lung cancer, they have antibodies to uh, ERV proteins, uh, envelope glycoproteins. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It seems to correlate with that. I don't know have it, if it has anything to do with the cancer or not. Um, but Yeah, like that, I remember that Nature paper from Kevin, yeah. Yes, yes, we actually had him on um, Immune, I believe, to, uh, oh, yeah. to talk about that. Yeah, these are very difficult things to, to look at because you don't know if it's causation or correlation, right? Yeah. Always a problem. What they, um, yeah, and we actually, I, I guess, just as a side note, I, we, our paper on PNMA2 came out last week. 
Yep. Those yep. naked capsids and hmm. generation generating right. autoimmune response. And that's also like so a, from a retrovirus or retrotransposon. Mm -hmm. Well, not a, retrotransposon. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 So that was Junji's work, right? Yeah. Yep. Came out and sell. Which week. he he talked about when he was on, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we don't need to go over that paper, right? No. 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 <laughs> okay. I just I saw and I said. Oh, we should do this. And then I realized- I know, we did it. Yeah, 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 go back. Talked all about it, yeah. Yeah, oh, we did okay. the preprint. Yeah, I can't yeah. remember which episode. Is he still with you or is he finished? Um, yeah, he's he's wrapping up. He he's he actually grad, he's going to graduate in spring and then he's going to do a postdoc at Harvard. Cool. We sad to leave him, see him leave. <laughs> Such a great student. Yeah, it's always hard to have people leave who are really, really good. Yeah. But that's, I kind of used to like that. Nobody is forever. You just everyone leaves. It's good. <laughs> I liked it anyway. <laughs> yeah, yep. it's good to see people yep. branch out. I mean, that's uh, the yeah. point of the training. Oh, well, you want you want them to do well and then to go somewhere else and do well. Yeah. Anyway, no, the I other mean, thing. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was gonna say yeah. As a PI, I mean, that's like the one of the best things you get to do is to see their development and see yeah. where they go. No, we had on Immune a couple of weeks ago, uh, Julia Morrison, who was a PhD student of mine, and she has a beautiful PNAS paper. It's cool that, <laughs> that that she's doing well. It makes me very happy. I did something right. I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> I did something right. There, there's a whole list of um, limitations, but the one is they say, the control tissue is a challenge um, because they're not, you know, they're older people who died of other things. Um, but they say we did try and limit um, thresholds and so forth so that we weren't misled. But there's not much you can do about that. Hmm. Anyway, that's the paper. It is, uh, you get a brain injury, you get neuroinflammation, and you get upregulation of endogenous retroviral RNAs. And now the question is, um, does it matter? On that, on the question of whether these uh, endogenous retroviruses actually is causal to any of these inflammation, yeah. if I remember correctly, um, people use pigs to look yes. at traumatic brain injury, like for like IDE, like explosive devices and stuff like that. The poor pigs, I think, mm. I don't even know if they wear helmets, um, but they just have to... Um, yeah. I think they get a, like a controlled knock on the head to see like this amount of force, what uh -huh. injury it causes. And if, I'm like, if I remember correctly, uh, a bunch of very ambitious people did the impossible and mm -hmm. took out all the, uh, the porcine, porcine endogenous <laughs> retroviruses, which is uh, yep. sadly, <laughs> weirdly called PERVs. So the pig version well, of that's these- That's the acronym. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the pig version of these um, uh, endogenous retroviruses. Um, so yeah. they can just test that on pigs. Absolutely. Yeah, I was think I was wondering if people do TBI in pigs. They do, yeah. If I remember correctly, question. they do it for like exposed, like for ID. Um, yeah. yeah. So you you may be wondering why they would. I think it was George Church, among other people, who have done that. Um, why they would make pigs lacking all the? They have like 60, 60 copies of the pervs. Mm. So he took them all out. Yeah, yeah. I think I heard on Twitter mm. you said like that would be impossible, and then they did it. <laughs> Years ago, I said it would be impossible, and then he did it, man. Although it was with CRISPR, um, so there might be off-target effect. We don't know. Um, so the pigs are not terribly healthy. Apparently. Oh, that's interesting. Um, anyway, they've done it for transplantation, right? Because you put a human valve into a person. So a pig valve. valve. Yeah, a pig valve. And you don't want you know, pig endogenous retroviruses to start reproducing and cause problems. Yep. So that's why they're done, but um, very difficult to make. You have to raise them, you know, in sterile facilities and so forth. Um, uh -huh. I, I saw a talk actually last year at a clinical virology meeting where a patient had received a, an, a heart transplant from a pig that they had taken all the pervs out. Um, and they have to check for so many different viruses, right, before they can do the transplant, you know, because the pig could be infected. Even if they're raised in a sterile facility, there could be viruses there anyway. Anyway, the person lived for a while, some months, um, 
I think eventually died of rejecting the pig heart. Hmm. Um, but they found a poor sign cytomegalovirus in the in the patient. Right. Which they had not detected in the pig by PCR because it was below the limit of the PCR. Wow. <laughs> below the limit of detection. Oh, no. They said this did not kill him, but it's kind of a warning that <laughs> there could be other viruses below the limit of detection of the PCR. So Yeah. This is tough, you know. This is really tough. Anyway, yeah. So that's a good experiment. Take those uh, perverse pigs and and see how they respond to TBI. Yep. I guess you could also find mice or rats that have no pervs as but, well. It might be easier. Actually, another question is like they focus on human and endogenous retroviruses here because we're working with humans. Yeah. But um, mice, you can mice can also have. You can model traumatic brain injury in rodents as well. And they okay. also have endogenous retroviruses that apparently are infectious, as Vincent said. So, yes, like, yes, so, some of them are. So yeah. does this also apply to mice, um, even though yeah, they don't have would be interesting. Yeah. I think the issue is like, oh, I mean, I, I, don't, I, I don't know how they did the pig, the pig study um, to get rid of them all, but there's so many copies. Um, yeah. And sometimes you, it's, you don't even know where those copies are in the genome. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, apparently the ones that they've used in people don't have any of them, so. Hmm. Well. Or at least any intact ones, that could be a problem, right? If they're broken, you really don't care because yeah. they're not going to give you viruses. Anyway, that's uh, oh. there's my hand at a, a, a twin paper, see? I hide <laughs> behind viruses. But it's super interesting because we, well, actually that's not, it's super interesting. I was going to say we don't ever talk about viruses on twin, but that's not true because that's I mean, not that's, true. Because Jason <laughs> yeah, we do. works on retrotransposon yeah. stuff, so that's a lot of crossover there. Um, well, of course there are. Yeah, you know, there's. Um, I feel like we we probably have to revisit this uh, the you know virus uh, COVID affecting the brain, the brain and all the studies have come out. Yeah, yeah, we we could get someone on who knows. Uh, so about it. Mm. I, I do you guys know Avi Nash at NIH? Yeah, I know the name. He's, a, he's the head of the clinical neuroscience division. You know, he does clinical trials. And he I I met him last year. He he had me come and give a seminar and he said he wasn't convinced that uh there's any virus reproduction in the brain from what he had seen. He says it's very tough to do, you know, unless you're a neuroscientist, it's hard to do the staining. And if you're an amateur, you're going to misinterpret. He showed me some examples in the literature. He said, this is an artifact. There's nothing here. <laughs> yeah. But I, I've seen a couple of recent papers, and I'm kind of like, well, there's, there's more and more evidence to it. Although it'd be good to sort of re review it. Yeah, we could go over it sometime. Yeah, there are lots of uh, interfaces of viruses in the CNS. And I mean, the whole retro endogenous retrovirus story is really just beginning, and I think. And that's going to turn out to be cool as well. Um, so. yeah. Do they at all serve any function in any animals, not just human? You know, well, so that's what I'm interested in. And, you know, there was this, um, uh, there's known roles for retrotransposons in development and fetal, de you know, fetus uh, embryo, embryo yeah. development. And, um, but whether the, there's a role for some of these in adult tissues, unclear. Mm. Well, but our work suggests that, you know, some of these retro, these virus-like um, signaling pathways are important. So. Yeah. Mm. But the syncytion is, is a, you can't, make a placenta without syncytion. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. right. And even some of these, like PEG-10, like these are some other these retrotransposon gag-containing proteins that that are important yeah. in the placenta mm -hmm. as well. But like in the case of syncytion, that was, these retroviruses are kind of accidents. They always get in because that's kind of how they yeah. evolutionally survive. And then accidentally through evolution, mammals kind of co-opted it for placenta. Yeah, and it's yeah. happened more than once. Yeah, it's happened like three yeah. separate times in mammalian evolution. I mean, we're talking about millions of years ago, way before mm. Homo sapiens, right? All of our like marsupials, some marsupials acquired uh, this retrovirus, and they developed into lineages that now have a placenta mm. instead of giving birth and then having it crawl into a pouch. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> you can have it get more developed inside. So. It's obviously 
really beneficial if it happens multiple times, mm. right? Independent yeah. um, adaptations. It's pretty cool. I like that. Yeah. All right. That's twin number 48. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash twin. And if you have any questions or comments, hadn't, hadn't gotten any in a long time, twin at microbe.tv. Send us a question. We'd love to read it. Uh, if you like what we do on these programs, uh, we'd love your financial support. Microbe.tv slash twin. You know, the company that does all this production. Microbe TV, we're a 5013C nonprofit. So in the U.S., your federal tax, you get a federal tax deduction by giving money to us. And we use it to do our productions. So we appreciate your support. Jason, Jason Shepard is at the University of Utah. And on Twitter, he's Jason Synaptic. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Vincent. That was, I always enjoy the retro, indulge this retrovirus uh, work. <laughs> you do. <laughs> <laughs> Tim Chung is at New York University. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Vincent. Yeah, it was really fun to learn about this. I know nothing about it. I know a little bit more now. <laughs> Good. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at microbe.tv. You've been listening to This Week in Neuroscience. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. Music